My name is Ignacio Arganda Carreras, and right now I'm a postdoc at the Modeling and Digital Imaging Lab at uh, the Institut Jean-Pierre Bourdieu and in Raversailles in France. But today I will be talking uh, mostly about my previous work in my previous postdoc at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where I was learning on how to look at the brain from the inside. And in particular, given my background in computer science and electrical engineering, I will uh, focus on the methods and algorithms that I develop, uh, especially to study brain connectomics. And they're all microscopy and image processing methods. So I will make a short introduction on connectomics and what connectomics is, and especially on the approach that we use at MIT with our collaborators at Harvard University using uh, electron microscope. And in particular, I will describe the image acquisition methods and the image processing methods that we use. And then, because not only because it is my field of expertise, but also because I think it is important for you uh, whenever you use any kind of uh, image processing tool or you have any kind of medical biological image uh, problem, I will describe some methods on image registration and image segmentation. And this would take about 55 minutes to an hour. And then if hopefully you read your emails, I told you to install a small software so we can play around with the, some of the tools that I, I've been talking about and then we don't, we don't need to feel sleepy after one hour, okay? So let's start. So first of all, what is a connectome? Because maybe you heard the term, maybe you didn't. If you didn't, as a, it was my case when I started my postdoc, I ran into the Wikipedia and then I tried to find a comprehensible definition of it. And there, they actually find one, which is a commonly a, a, um, accepted definition that says that a connectome is a comprehensive map of neural connections in the brain. It's quite generic, right? But if you go into the detail, you say that, you see that it may range from in a scale from either a very detailed map of full connections from either the entire uh, brain or just parts of a brain of a nervous system to a more um, macro scale definition of the, the function or the structure of the, the connectivity between areas of the brain. In general, just keep in mind that uh, connectomics or connectome uh, refers to all these scientific efforts to, to capture, to map, all the, um, how the, 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 um, the nervous system organizes, uh, how the neural interactions in the brain uh, organize. But don't be surprised if reading some papers, you, you get some confusion between terms. Um, actually, it would be interesting to define two types of connectomics based on the scale. One that was first described by all of us porn some collaborators that says that connectomics studies connections between brain regions through the white matter. And they estimate this using diffusion tensor imaging that provide these uh, beautiful, colorful images that unveil the structure of, of uh, big highways of uh, nerves in the brain, right? And then uh, they associate this structure with function using functional MRI, as Maria said. We can see which areas of the brain get activated at which time and then associate it with these uh, structures. Of course, this is a macro scale view of it. You will hear more about, uh, about it tomorrow. And we could maybe call this macro connectomics, given the size and the scale, or maybe um, projectomics. But today I'm gonna refer to this other type of connectomics, that is and the one that was defined by uh, Jeff Lichtman at the Harvard University and my uh, former PI at MIT, Sebastian Sen that said that connectomics studied actual uh, synaptic connections uh, between individual neurons. And for that we use um, re high resolution stack of electron microscopy images. And for high resolution, I mean nanoscopic resolution. So we actually see organelles, we see synapses between individual regions. For that reason, we can maybe call this micro or even nano connectomics or even synaptomics because <coughs> as I said, we're gonna be able to visualize the synapses between all the, all the neurons. I have a question. Yes? Is there any agreed uh, meaning of this uh, suffix omics? I mean, you also have economics. 
I think they, they, they just came up with a fancy name to, to, to be able to sell it better. Same as with the genome, and the, they said, okay, let's, let's make the connectome. But it's, it's actually some papers about making fun of it, yeah? Um, here, when you mentioned these two different kinds of connectomics, are they nowadays already high throughput, or is the, this micro connectomic still very low throughput compared to this other? Um, let me show you what, uh, what we get, and then maybe that answers your question. Um, there's just a few labs working on it, um, but we built already quite a, a very established pipeline. So. I, I don't know if I could say high throughput, but quite, quite yes. So, um, of course, you could ask me, why are we interested in synaptic connections in the first place? Well, we're interested in synaptic connections because we know that the function of a neuron is largely determined by the inputs of that neuron. And the function of a network of neurons is mostly determined by the inputs of that network of neurons, but also the intrinsic connections between the neurons in the network. So we expect that knowing the rules of connectivity in the real neural network, in the physical neural network, we're going to be able to constrain our model, our functional model, our um, model in the computer, in the circuit. This is actually how many people started working on, on this type of connectomics, because they were um, trying for years to, to model some specific neural networks, but they always get stuck at a point where they didn't know the, the real connections, so they couldn't model it properly. Okay, so you could ask me as well, okay, if synaptic connectivity is so important, why hasn't it been studied before or in more detail? Well, first, because methodologically it's very difficult. Light microscopy was until very recently two cores for dense reconstructions of the neuropil. By dense reconstruction, I mean you have a whole block of tissue full of neurons and you want to have um, labels for each of them. Not just single label neurons, but you want to have everything, let's say, with a different color. Now we are uh, getting uh, to that possibility with some techniques, at, uh, the, the rainbow, for example, but we're still far from the resolution that we can get uh, using, for example, electron microscopy. And then, yes? Yeah, when you said that light microscopy was too coarse for dense reconstruction of neuropil, would you say that, for example, nowadays, a lab that already does in vitro patching could actually use their uh, uh, lab, the, the microscope, the light microscope, to do this kind of... Yeah, there's some yeah, very, very new, um, especially two-photon microscopes that can actually work with, a, with a, um, Rainbow. They can give you a very high resolution of uh, multicolor images. And even in, I, I seen that in vivo with uh, some fancy confocal uh, microscopes. And, okay, so we could also do some staining and electro recordings, but they could only um, sample a very small subset of neurons. So we will never get to the, all the connections in that block of tissue that I'm talking about, right? And we had serial section electron microscopy with enough resolution uh, to do this. But the problem is that it produces an incredibly large amount of data. And what is an incredibly large amount of data? Well, let me show you some numbers. If we look at the brain volumes of the typical model species that we study in neuroscience. And uh, we mind that we have an electron microscope that gives us a resolution of uh, 10 nanometer. 10 nanometer isotropic resolution. That means 10 nanometer uh, in X and Y per pixel, but also in the C direction. Well, that would mean that for uh, storing, just storing one uh, cubic micron of that volume in our hard drive, we would need one megabyte, okay? So let's see the numbers. If, uh, for example, we look at the C. elegans, this millimetric um, worm, that was actually the first one whose connectome was completely reconstructed. It's uh, 302 neurons. Well, just storing the whole worm at that resolution could mean one terabyte of hard drive, which right now it doesn't sound that bad. We can go to the store, buy some external hard drives, one, two terabytes. You can find it on personal computers and laptops. But imagine that this is just to store the, the data. I'm not talking about any processing yet. Sorry, could you explain what, what, is in, what is captured in this data? What information is there? I don't think I can understand this. I mean, why would it be so much? Just 
you are imaging the, the data at this resolution. Well, I mean, the data is like is the, the like, is serial like sections, things? for example, well, I'll show you later the type of microscopy, but for example, serial sections of, of your tissue. And then you image it, so you get 10 nanometer resolution. You mean one number per voxel, and one byte per Yeah, so I mean, every voxel represents 10 nanometers of the, of the tissue. I'll show you some images later, so you see. Actually, right away. So in mind that uh, if we work with Drosophila, for example, with a brain of around 0.5 cubic millimeters and 80,000, an estimation of 80,000 neurons, just storing all this volume as images of that resolution, we need 125 terabytes of hard drive. Same for the, the larva, the zebra fish. And if we go for um, larger uh, brains, such as the mouse, of course we're interested in the mouse, with 7.6 cubic millimeters of volume and estimation of 75,000 millions of neurons, well, this became completely prohibitive. We have 450,000 terabytes of hard drive. Or even if we just want to store the cortical column, then it would be 1,000 terabytes. And of course, we can get dreamy, look at the, the, the numbers of the human brain, and then with the, its 1.3 liters and an estimation of 100,000 millions of neurons, well, that would become the crazy number of 1,300 millions of terabytes, 1.3 zettabytes. So, of course, when most people see these numbers, most neuroscientists, they say, okay, you should just give up. You cannot even store your data in a proper and affordable hard drive. Why well, you should even care on processing it, on extracting information from it. And somehow they're right because these numbers look very prohibitive. But somehow they're wrong, because uh, as Wikipedia told us, this is not only about um, analyzing the, the entire brain, we can also focus on parts of the brain, parts of the uh, specific neural networks. And also because we know that technology is on our side. You look at, for example, um, the cost of data storage, and uh, the cost actually per gigabyte, dollars per gigabyte, over, over the past 30 years. So we see how very constantly the price has been reduced by a factor of 10 roughly every four years. So if we look at the, if we extend this line into the future, we can see how in just in a five, six years, we would. Did we get money back? <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> we would get, uh, hopefully, uh, a very feasible, uh, I mean, affordable hard drive to make the whole mouse brain feasible. In about 20 years, that would be the case for the whole human brain. This, I'm talking about the hard drive of around 50K. So we're <laughs> reaching this point where data storage is becoming not a problem. And this is just to show you how technology goes and on our direction. But for you to get a better idea of the, the resolution that I'm talking about, I don't know, we can change the contrast of the screen or something? It's, this guy is not as dark as it looks like. Well, let's see if it changes. Um, let me show you this video. So this is uh, Bobby Casturi. This is a, a postdoc at Jeff Lickman Lab, one of our collaborators lab at Harvard University. And he's posing in front of uh, our electron microscope. And on his hand, he's holding a wafer with you don't see much, but about 90 to 100 serial sections of uh, mouse cortex, which is our main data set here. So if we zoom in, hopefully, we'll start to see what I'm talking about. We have some stripes here with all the sections. So be able to see some squares now. Those are the sections. You can start to see the, the tissue. Let's see. You see some circular structure here. This is the hippocampus. Those are some uh, layers of the cortex. OK, right now. See some blood vessels start to differentiate uh, cell bodies and some dendrites uh, running from left to right. Some uh, axons, myelinated axons, you see with these thick um, membranes. And then when we get to the highest resolution, we start to see all these organelles that we studied in our science class. We see uh, mitochondria. Oh, you probably have to believe me on this, but you see <laughs> these are mitochondria. You see membranes, double membranes, you see vesicles. And actually, if, 
if you believe me and you look at this center area here, we will see a synapse. This is the end of an action. This is full of vesicles. This is the synaptic space. And this is the other part of the, of the synapse, the dendrite, that receives the... Can I ask a uh, maybe stupid question, but maybe not? So whenever I look, I mean, I'm not a biologist. Mm -hmm. Whenever I look at these images, I think, well, this looks like Stone Age drawings. So now from a, from a scientific point of view, you tell us this is a synapse, but can you actually validate that it's a synapse? But how do you actually know? This is a very good question. Instead asking your professor, so that doesn't count. So is there a scientific method to find out that this is really a synapse? So based, uh, yeah, so I actually I asked my professor, how do I know to, that this is a synapse? And then uh, actually, even before we get this kind of a stain in, uh, I'll show you later, there's some stain that only shows um, membranes and the inside of the cells. So there's no uh, organelles, and it's not as clear as here because you don't see all the, the vesicles with the neurotransmitter on one side and the dendrite on the other side. Um, but they, they started to kind of infer the synapses based on the shape of, of the neurons, so from some morphological uh, features. That wasn't very good. Uh, you ask me my opinion, but then here we have even more features and then the fact that we get the shape plus all of these um, vesicles on, on one side and this area, you don't see it very well here, but it gets um, darker and it also you can, sometimes you can even put a label on the synapses so you can make sure that this is an actual synapse. There are some people that actually only label synapses on this kind of data set. But is it also this separate line of work where they have like gold particles attached to particular antibodies which attach to certain receptors? I mean, so you have like a separate way of, a separate uh, way of doing anatomy which sort of can sort of add to this. You mean to, to, to label the, this kind of thing? To label certain elements of the membrane with gold and uh, yeah. so it's like attached to, I mean, so, so then blue to make the same. Yeah, this, this is actually... This is a line of research where they, they're trying to play with the different labels to, for example, uh, just get synapses and membranes. That would be awesome for my, uh, well, I mean, my application. But it's always important to remember that I mean, this is the morphological correlate of what we say is a synapse. And it has a very defined signature. And there's a set of criteria by which you would identify it. But in terms of you know, synapse itself and synaptic transmission is a functional concept. So whether these two things are exactly co-located, um, again, is, is, is an open question in all cases because I suspect there's all kinds of transmission that is captured in a functional um, signal going from one place to the next that may not occur exactly at that location. But as always in biology, there's a weight of evidence that accumulates over the years that this thing is, it, that this is a place. Where yeah, so I understand this that. one way. Yeah, you have a yeah. set of criteria, you go into your image, and then you see it. Yes. Yeah. But now the question is, can you go back? Now, can I take now this very, very image and somehow test my hypothesis that this thing, maybe in cases where it's not as clear as this one, yeah? so can you do the, the validation, the, the testing of your hypothesis that this might be a synapse? So it fulfills all your criteria, but maybe there's criterion n plus 1. Mm -hmm. Which you haven't discovered yet. Yeah, this is a very interactive session. Oh, yeah. Please use your microphone and raise ah. your hand when you want to ask a question. Okay, so the, the question was when you have a set of criteria and you go into this image and you tick them all off, you say, yes, this is a synapse, but maybe there is something new that you haven't seen before. Is there a way to go back and actually cross check? Yeah, so there, there are um, some people working on these kind of things. They, for example, they image first. The, the same data set with the, um, well, some light microscopy, and then, for example, just labeling the synapses or uh, some specific neurons, and then they try to match afterwards, after the image at this resolution with EM, the LM with the EM, and see if they actually see what they, they think they're seeing. Uh, hello. Yeah. I just want to extend this question about neurotransmitters. So can we take any image or any quantization of the vesicles, the release of uh, vesicle patterns or anything, 
we can get any data about this you know how to quantify the vesicles or how to take picture uh, the release of vesicle pattern I, I'm not sure I understood. So yeah. you're asking if uh, we can label any of the organelles? Yeah, in terms of uh, uh, scaling, suppose number of neurotransmitters and number of vesicles releasing profiles. Okay, so at this resolution, yeah, I didn't mention that. So this is uh, our uh, highest resolution. So, so this is uh, per pixel, we have six nanometers in X and Y. So it depends on the size of what, the, what you're trying to see, of course. And, and then in the Z direction, because this is an actual cat of the tissue, we have 30 nanometers. So this is not isotropic data. So you could see the, maybe the vesicles on and, and X and Y, but you could maybe lose some of them in the Z direction using this technique. But I'll show you some others. So as I said, we're not all interested in, in, the, in the 2D part, but we'll want to look at the whole block of tissue, and for that we need to reconstruct it in 3D. And as I was mentioning, this is actually anisotropic, so we have to interpolate, but you see how, well, hopefully you'll see how and the whole structure is going recovered. And then we can go back to the 2D and start to identify uh, single neurites. And then we can, for example, color uh, this red neurite here, and uh, iteratively unveil the 3D structure of the neurite inside the, the block of tissue. And for example, reconstruct any, any other neurite that uh, contacts it. In this case, we have this green neurite that touches the red one in two places. And the good thing of this technique is that then we can go back to the 2D and then check, as I, as I did, uh, if the actual touch was just a random one, or if, as it is the case here, we see the the same feature that tells us, okay, this is a synapse. We have the, the axon that then drive the synapse and the, the synaptic uh, space. And as I said, we want to do dense reconstructions. We are not just interested in labeling uh, beautiful single uh, neurons, but we need to fill all the gaps in the block of tissue. We need to uh, basically color everything that is passing through, everything that connects to anything, and then once we have that, we go to all the touches, we check their synapses, and then we build our connectomics in information, our connectivity matrix, if you want. And well, you see some gaps, it's because we didn't label the glial cells because they don't connect to anything. Okay, so how do we do this? Let me show you the, the whole pipeline that we develop in, uh, yep. When you reconstruct one of these cells, When you do one of these reconstructions uh, of mm. the whole block, do you actually do several blocks and then you try to also match those? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, because, uh, well, there's some limitations in the software that, that we were using at a time, and then we have to then match all of those blocks that were uh, together or side by side. Okay. So, yeah, let me show you the, the pipeline of uh, what we did in, in our project at uh, MIT and Harvard. We had first the sample preparation. As I said, we were with mouse. We struck the brain, and then we first cut the brain uh, as thick sections with a vibrotome, around 100 to 200 uh, micron sections. And then we stained them with heavy metals, which gives them this um, darkish color, even darker in this screen. And then they finally get dehydrated and embedded into a, an epoxy resin. So this whole process takes about one week of work. And after that, we get this. We get this uh, thick section embedded into this uh, jellowish resin that looks like uh, the Jurassic Park uh, insects, right? So here is when you have different options about the, the, the imaging. We get, um, in general, three big options. In, they all have their advantages and disadvantages. It mostly depends on the field of view that you need for your experiment, the resolution, and how deep you want to go into the tissue. For example, you can use a serial block phase EM that was first developed in, in the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. And then you, in this case, the tissue gets stuck here and it gets cat and image at the same time, which gives you um, a very well-aligned data, because it's just you cut an image. 
but um, it's not isotropic because the the resolution in the C direction depends on the on how thin you can cut, of course. And there's some limitations also in the field of view that you can you can use here. Then you can use uh, focus ion beam SCM, FIPSEM, which literally bonds the, the tissue with the laser while you image, <coughs> but gives you the, the highest resolution that I've seen. Like you, you can get this isotropic resolution, and you can get as down as one nanometer per voxel in X, Y, and C. So this is uh, where you can see vesicles even in the, in the Z direction. But there's some limitations. Of course, the data is aligned. And it's uh, it's very high resolution, but you have strong limitation in the in the field of view, and also in how deep you can go in, into the tissue. And finally, there's the third option, which is called Atom. It stands by Automatic Tape Collecting Ultra Microtom. This was developed in Jeff Lichtman lab, and it's um, ultra microtom coupled with a, a tape collecting machine. So here, what we do is we cut the tissue. We set it on, the, on this tape, and then we can image it as uh, as large field of view as we want. But there's also the limitation of the of the thickness or how thin we can cut, and uh, that the, the tissue gets misaligned while you cut it and put it on the tape. But because we were interested in large field of views, we use this uh, technique. Uh, let me show you how. But the first thing you do is you you trim your um, your resin, so you fit it onto this metallic piece that goes into the ultra microtom that is, by the way, developed by, by Leica. And then you just place the, the tape collecting machine in front of it. So you're gonna, there's a diamond knife here, and then it's gonna smoothly cut it, and it goes into the, into the tape. Let me show you. This is uh, our technician just setting up the, the, tape, in, the tape collecting machine. It takes a few minutes, and then you can leave it run it overnight. So you see how the block of tissue is here. It gets iteratively cut, and then set on this um, tape. So at the end of the day, you can have a very large uh, tape, like a f one of the old films with each frame. It's one section of your tissue block. So after this, of course, we just have to cut the pieces, put it on a wafer, the same kind of wafer that Bobby was holding on his hand in the, the first video I showed you, and then image it on the electron microscope that you have at hand. In, in our case, we have a um, specific uh, software that we made at home, so you can image at uh, each section. It recognizes automatically all the sections and image roughly the same areas. But as I told you at the beginning, the, the alignment is lost in the, in the process. So you see that even at this low resolution, it's almost impossible, n not just not to, give dizzy, to get dizzy, but also to follow any of these uh, processes in, in 3D. So the first thing you have to do from a computer science, size uh, um, sense of view is the image alignment and stitching. So the stitching just means that you took different snapshots of your section, then you have to recompose the mosaic to have a single image per section and then align in between the sections. And this is not an easy task, believe me, because, well, this is not uh, super common, but you can get tissue burned, torn, you can get some noise, dirt, some problems with the, some artifacts introduced by the, the cutting knife, you can get images with overexposure, uh, etc. So you need to develop methods afterwards, yes, in your computer that can deal with this kind of images. <coughs> Just a quick question. Do you use techniques uh, used in the geographical area, like for um, remote sensing imaging? They probably do the same type of registration. Is there any connection at all? Do, do people use the same methods for image registration, or is it totally different in your field? I'm not related to that field, but I think the image registration in general is applied to many different type of images. Because I actually myself develop some algorithms. I get people sending me emails to register all kind of images, even from frames from uh, cinema movies and stuff. So, yeah, the the image can be different, but the, the techniques remain the same. You just need to identify 
uh, common points on consecutive sections and then use them to, to do the registration. In this case, well, just for you to know what we used, we had some hierarchical approach from low resolution to high resolution. We find uh, by cross correlation some uh, correspondences and then find the relative position of all the tiles and then the absolute position of uh, all the sections in the whole sequence. And after that, once we have everything aligned, we need to do the labeling. We need to, as I told you before, color each of the neurites in the block of tissue with a different color, giving it a, a, different, a different ID. So the first thing you can think of is just doing it manually. So this is what we did as, as a proof of concept. This is uh, another uh, postdoc in our lab, Daniel Berger, who spent quite a bit uh, of time just doing what we were doing when we were kids, painting in between the lines. So he, he loaded uh, a small portion of the block of tissue into the uh, software called ITK Snap. And then he goes section by section, selecting a different color for each of the neurites, and then painting everything that is on, on the whole uh, block of tissue. And as you can imagine, this is a very te <coughs> tedious work, and it can give you serious back problems, and especially you don't have the right chair or the right touch screen. And it's not really, really worth it if you look at the, the, the whole data set. So he, he actually manually painted these two um, small data sets. They have their images of 1,024 by 1,024 uh, pixels. That was the limitation of the software that we used at a time. And one has 100 slices and the other one 256 slices. So it took him months to, to finish the, the work and be completely sure that he didn't uh, have any error. Actually, another person did it as well, so we could compare and check if they were right. And he found uh, around about 400 objects, 400 new rights or pieces of new rights and, and one and 600 on the other one. But this really tells you the need that we have to scale this up. So we need to go for automatic solutions. We need to go for software that can handle uh, this data this large. And at the time it wasn't that easy. So we need to design ourselves uh, large scale segmentation tools, automatic tools, and have a way of validating our results. And for that, we, w we went for the, um, the so-called citizen science solution that I'll, I'll, I'll show you later. And just for you to know, we, we use a um, two-step approach on the segmentation. That we, we train some machine learning algorithm. It's called a convolutional neural network that gives us the probabilities of objects being together or not in our block of tissue. And then we use some, some other method called a water set to have a hierarchical labeling of those objects based on the threshold that we can apply on those probabilities. So now the thing is how to validate that because we need to choose the best threshold that gives us the, the, the minimum number of errors. <coughs> and for that, we get, uh, again, we made uh, our own software. It's called Omni, where the users could just load the data set. Where here, she so could see overlaying the, 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 the new rate that he or she selects. And then a theory reconstruction of the same. So you could go check in every new rate and see if there is a split or a merger in the 3D in, in the reconstruction and then change the threshold manually and then set it for that specific new rate. So we get a few students and a few technicians doing this, especially over the summer. And then we realized that if we want to scale this up for this huge data set that we had, then we needed to explore other possibilities and put this somewhere else. And because we knew that this task is, is actually one that doesn't require um, specific expertise or much knowledge about the, the tissue, we decided to go into the citizen science solution, the crowdsource solution. So we put this, we actually, this, this is the real name, we ga gamify this problem to put it in the web, so we make a game out of it so people can uh, correct our, the mistakes of our uh, uh, computer methods, making some points and playing against other users, so they, they, at the same time they have some fun, they, they can actually 
uh, correct our mistakes. So we, we have time in the demo time, I'll show you how this works. So as I said, this is the whole pipeline that we developed over there. Um, as I told you, we are at this point where, well, image acquisition is not a problem. We're producing much more <coughs> data that we can handle. Uh, the data storage is becoming not a problem. The problem is now on my side, on the computer part. So I always like to quote here uh, Isaac Asimov that said that we're reaching the stage where the problems we must solve are going to be unsolvable. I, I would say they are already unsolvable without computers. We shouldn't lack, uh, we shouldn't fear the computers, we should fear the lack of them. And in particular, um, all the computer methods that I've been developing over the past years, um, I developed them in an open source platform that may, maybe some of you know, that is called uh, Fiji. Or maybe you know ImageJ. ImageJ is a very popular open source uh, toolkit for uh, biological and medical image processing. And Fiji is just a distribution, with, uh, which comes with a lot of solutions for this type of pipelines in connectomics. Not only connectomics, but also medic uh, biomedical image processing. So, I'm, I'm going to spend some time talking about it because I think it's, it will be useful for you. You actually have here um, a set of plugins, so-called small parts of the, of the program are called plugins, that allows you to import all, ki all kind of biological data, n-dimensional data. You have plugins to, in to do the image registration, image stitching of uh, 2D, 3D images. You have ways of visualizing that data in, in 2D, 3D, 4D, and also some manual, semi-automatic and automatic tools to do the uh, annotation of those data sets. And more importantly, you can, based on those annotations, then use some tools to <coughs> quantify, extract the, the, the numbers, the statistics of uh, your image data. So first of all, uh, because it's my area of expertise, but also because I think that in, in general neuroscience, whenever you want to work with images, you're going to have to deal with this type of problems. I will describe in a little bit more in detail what is out there for image registration and image segmentation. <coughs> uh, hopefully you will find it useful. Well, first of all, uh, just a bit introduction about image registration, because well, we all know that it has to do with aligning 2D uh, or 3D images, either a pair or a sequence of images. It uh, formally it has to do with um, the type of transformation that we expect between those images. So, uh, for example, if you are trying to align images that you took from um, a microscope and you know the stage just shifts a bit, well, you know that you, are, you have to do with it with the translation. If it rotates, then it's a rotation. You have translation and rotation is a rigid body transformation. This this kind of things. Those uh, changes that are let's call them simple, They're, they have a linear uh, solution out of them, then those are more or less easy to solve. And then there is some not that simple uh, problems when the, the tissue, for example, uh, get, gets torn or folded or stretched, and then you need to use some more complicated uh, mathematical tricks to solve the, the, the deformation, basically treating the image as if you were elastic, or use some local corrections, etc. In any case, the search of a common coordinate system is going to be very, very important whenever you have to integrate or compare uh, image data that you obtain from either different samples, different image modalities, or you obtain it with a different measurement. You always have to bring everything to the same coordinate system and then over there start measuring. So in Fiji, there's a bunch of options for that. Um, I, I will go only about some of them that are uh, kind of a state of the art right now because there's some old ones as well. Um, for example, there is one called register virtual stacks slices that I, I, I developed with some collaborators. I will, you'll see that in my slices, I, I put a, a link here in my slides so you can go actually to the, to the data, I mean to the, um, to the website to see the, the, the software you need. In this case, this program, what it does is that it registers virtually uh, any large sequences of 2D image data. And for that, it uses uh, something called SIFT, that stands for Scale Invariant Feature Transform. And it, it's, those are some 
specific points in images that are invariant to changes in the scale, in the perspective, in the zoom, etc. This is exactly what you, most cameras do, for example, in your phone, when you take a panorama picture. What they do, they take the overlapping area between the different snapshots of your scene, and then they try to find those points. Because based on those points that are in, in both images, you can find a model and then reconstruct your panorama. Well, you can actually do the same thing when you have consecutive sections, especially in this type of studies, because the sections, they really look like each other if you, if you don't use very thick sections, right? So those points are going to still be there. You can use it for stitching, or you can use it for registration in between uh, sequences of images. And then you can choose a transformation model and apply it to those points. Then there is uh, some more complicated solutions. For example, something I, I developed uh, during my PhD thesis that treats the images as if they were elastic because I was working with histological sections of uh, mammary, mouse mammary gland. And of course the tissue has some el elasticity properties and sometimes I need to recover from that. Well, uh, we came up with a solution to, based on BS splines, treat the images as if they were elastic and then recover and uh, actually calculate the transformation and the elastic transformation between the so-called warp image and the unwarp image. And then, well, I, I developed it further. Uh, the people started to use it in neuroscience. This is actually how I get into neuroscience because it became popular on EM uh, sections. So I had to actually improve it further, use, uh, make it uh, usable with uh, multi-threads, uh, able to handle large images, uh, compatible with the SIF correspondences to, to do uh, proper initialization, etc. How do you recognize the warped image? When, if you're, are you doing this manually? So, at the beginning, well, this is a, a, a weird example, right? Um, yes, you can select which one is your reference. So, you have a sequence. Yeah, people, for example, in a sequence selects the, the, the one that looks better or that is in the middle. Yeah, but this is a good question because if you, you select the bad one, then you're going to warp everything into uh, something that looks uh, not very realistic. And that's why we went farther. And then now the state of the art is uh, another approach that in, in Fiji just called elastic alignment or elastic uh, montage. It has kind of the same idea behind, but instead of using B-splines, B -splines, it uses a system of um, not triangles, but springs that looks like triangles here. But the good, the good property that they, they tend, all these springs make, made the, um, the, the image or the deformation to be as rigid as possible to avoid uh, spreading a lot of errors. And then even if you have, for example, a deformation in the middle of the image, then you could only get uh, st a strong deformations in, in the middle and then the borders would remain more or less in place. Uh, this, was this is developed by Stefan Salfel, that was a PhD student at uh, Max Planck Institute in, in Dresden, and is right now a junior PI at uh, Janilia Farms. And this is what we use right now for uh, our sequences of EM images, because it, it, it's also able to deal with all type of images of any size, and it doesn't um, block your RAM memory, and you can leave it run it overnight, and you have, uh, or even for weeks, you have terabytes of data and you have uh, very nice results, as I will show you later. And of course, after you have the, the alignment done, you want to have your image labels. Actually, image segmentation is something that some people call an ill-defined problem, because some people understand different things from it. Like, uh, almost everybody understands this. Uh, it's the process of partitioning a uh, digital image into multiple segments. That's why we call it segmentation. But it's true that some people understand there is the, the, the process of extracting the objects of your image, or at least the boundaries, as it is the case here. And I like this other definition. It says that, uh, more precisely, the, the, pro the image segmentation process is the one of assigning to each pixel a label such that all the pixels with the same label, they share some characteristics. For example, in, in, in this image, we can say, okay, to all my cell pixels, I'm going to set blue label. And then 
uh, green to my cell bodies, yellow to my, uh, my membranes, and black to my background, for example. Or you could say, and this is another correct way of segmenting, I want to do what you told me before, Ignacio, and I want to do the dense reconstruction, and I want to have a different label per uh, object. So each cell would have a different color. These are all correct, but these are different ways of interpreting uh, image segmentation. The easiest or the simplest way is to start by extracting just the borders and then deciding later what to do. Uh, and in, in this platform, we had many solutions from the simplest ones, for example, segmentation via threshold, where you get your image, you, you just plot the histogram and set a, a threshold value and say, OK, from my threshold to the left, everything is going to be background. From my threshold to the right, everything is going to be uh, foreground. There's uh, multiple ways of doing this automatically, and um, many of them are uh, already implemented there. You can do segmentation via clustering, for example, playing k-means on the, on, on the, on the color uh, components. You can do uh, also directly some edge detection by filtering, for example. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, please, uh, the, using the threshold, did you classify based on the intensity of the image Mm -hmm. The first one, is it the intensity or just? Yeah, this is the intensity. OK, just like a, a MRI, just yeah. like MRI segmentation. Uh, well, it depends on the type of segmentation. But uh, this is the simplest way. You just plot the histogram of the intensities, and then just say, OK, see if these are, for example, 8-bit images, so I have values from 0 to 255, I say, OK, my threshold is going to be 128. So everything that is not up to 128 is going to be background, the rest foreground. But this is the simplest way. There are also um, ways of automatically selecting the threshold that look at the, um, at, at the regions of the image and then decide based on that, not, not as arbitrary as I just did. No? Mm. And then, yeah, there's also, for example, uh, filtering. You can do for example, a smooth your image and then apply a, a gradient operator, such as a Sobel, and then you extract uh, borders. Or you could go for um, non such deterministic um, uh, methods, but go for something a little bit uh, more complicated, for example, uh, growing methods, region growing methods. In this case, what you do is like, for example, you manually set a few seeds on your image, and then you're going to grow regions until they, they serve some minimum area and some similarity values. And then when you reach the border of, of the image, then you already get uh, those regions. This is called uh, level sets. It's uh, implemented also in 3D in, uh, in Fiji. Or there is a classic uh, approach as well that is called uh, water set, well, kind of uh, uh, morphological approach, where you treat your image as if it were a topological surface, and then you simulate water levels from the, the minimum height uh, by different steps. And then when those levels reach each other, then you, you create a, a new basin with a different color. And then you directly get the, yes? How do you define here the, the values for the topographic surfaces? So what is the height? Would it be the colors? Would it be yeah, so parameters? Uh, usually, you, yeah, you get the intensities, but what it's uh, most commonly used is you first apply a gradient over the image, so you get uh, on the borders you get peaks, and then on the flat areas you get uh, just almost black color, right? So you can get you start having minimums here, minimums in the black areas, and then those are gonna be your uh, your <coughs> starting water levels and then it, you go up. Yeah, I yeah, should get a better slide for this. Anyway, uh, there's also some solutions there. I, I created an interactive interface. You can play around with it in, in Fiji as well. And finally, um, where I spent most of my uh, research time when I was in Boston, I was developing machine learning uh, methods to do the segmentation, hopefully, of my EM uh, sections. 
in, by machine learning, what we mean is that we want the computer to learn how to do the task for us based on a few samples that we provide. And how, how do we do this, for example, with, uh, with our images? OK, look at this. We have an original image. In this case, it's a TEM section from a drosophila larva brain. And what we're going to do is we're going to create some features, which are nothing but filter versions of the same image that enhance some specific characteristics of the, of the image. For example, we can use uh, edge detectors uh, uh, again, or some texture filters, etc. Anything that we think that is going to help us to discriminate between what we want to segment here. And let's say we want to, uh, for example, segment between uh, membrane pixels and non-membrane pixels. So I go, there's an interface for this. I'll show you later in the, in the demo time. And then I just paint a few pixels, for example, you don't see much here, in green over the membrane. And then I, I paint a few red pixels in, uh, over areas that have no membrane. And then what I'm going to do, this is the trick. You represent each of those pixels, not only by the pixel value, by a vector that has the pixel value in the same positions, but in all the, the filter versions of it. So I have a feature vector. And then at the end, those feature vectors are already classified as red or green, because I did it manually, right? But this is the, the perfect environment for all the machine learning methods to learn how to classify other vectors that haven't been manually labeled as I did. So I can just represent the rest of pixels. Well, I can train first my classifier, and then I represent the other <coughs> pixels as vectors as, as well. And the classifier is going to provide me with the uh, predicted uh, classification of each of the pixels. I hope uh, you understood better when we went into the demo time. And then finally, which I consider the, the most important part of the platform, especially you work in Connectomics, is this plugin called TrackEM2 that was uh, first developed by Albert Cardona that uh, used to work at the Institute of Neuroinformatics in Zurich. He's now a PI at Janelia Farms. I, I worked with him over the years on, on this software. And it has all the tools that I've been talking about to produce this um, pipeline to do the connectomics studies. It, has, it integrates the stitching, registration, editing, and annotation tools. It has morphological data mining and three-dimensional modeling tools. But most importantly, it has a very robust and straightforward workflow to deal with large data sets. So this means that even if you have terabytes of data, you can use your laptop or your regular computer and then open the data sets, work with it, and you're never going to run out of memory. Why? Because it uses a system of MIP maps. So what we do is that we only load into memory a version of the image that adapts to the zoom that you're looking at and the size of the patch that you're looking at. So you never load everything into memory and, and, and collapse. Let me show you what you can do with it. Uh, for example, you can do the type of image alignment that I was mentioning before with the correspondences. You can find all the correspondences between tiles and then make the mosaic, in this case again, of a drosophila larva brain. And then you can do this iteratively for all the sections that you have on your AM sequence. But also, you can find those correspondences between sections and then use it to have a proper 2D linear alignment of your data set, which in this case uh, was enough, but it's not always the case. Let me show you here. This is, again, a whole uh, section of uh, Drosophila, Drosophila larva brain, four different zooms. And here we just used rigid alignment. Rigid means only translation and rotation. But this data set in particular was very noisy. So you see how when I uh, uh, go through the, the sections, they get very, very jittery. And it's very hard to follow any of these processes, especially at the highest resolution, for more than two, three sections. Even manually, we get lost, if not DC. But luckily for us, we also implemented the Elastic solution here with the system of springs. And then you see it's the same data set, how everything gets much more stabilized, even in the presence of noise. And then you can follow 
very easily, at least manually, all of these processes through the data set. So here, when we get this quality of data, is when we, we kind of start uh, painting. Yes? I have a question now. So if you do this elastic alignment, it means basically that you have to deform any geometrical shape that you have in each of the frames, right? Yeah, based on this triangle. So. Yeah. So um, would you be able to draw something like error boundaries around membranes, for example, that capture the possible error that you made due to this deformation? Yeah. So. That's a good question. It depends on how strong the deformation is at the end. But the, the good thing of this approach is that uh, it tends to be as rigid as possible. They actually apply just local rigid deform. And it's not, uh, I mean, unless you have a completely tissue torn or something like this, it, it actually renders the, the, the data much more usable. You see. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it depends. Like you can select the size of the triangle, and then you set it to a small. Then maybe it's smaller than uh, some of the objects that you have here, and then you can completely uh, destroy it or even fold it. You have to play with those parameters. It's not straightforward. You just not just click the button and it works. Unfortunately, and yeah, of course, then you can just, as I said, yep. On, on that alignment method, uh, does it always work on the same scale, or could you actually do first, for example, local with smaller triangles and then go to broader with? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is something uh, we usually do. You, you observe there is one big, small, I mean, big deformation uh, over the whole image, and then you want to refine on specific areas that have something particular of just that area of the brain and not the whole thing. You just pass once with some parameters, and then go back to those. So you start with a bigger mesh, and then it keeps getting thin. Mm. Yeah, tuning, I have to say that tuning that, uh, that algorithm is, is not trivial. It's a, it's a bit of a trial and error. But it gives you very, very nice results on, on EM. And of course, afterwards, uh, well, there's plenty of tools to do what Daniel was doing in the video. You can manually paint everything that is on your images and then select some of these objects and render them in 3D. You could render everything, but you're not going to see much. Or um, some other people, instead of doing uh, dense reconstructions, they also go for the manual solution, but they prefer to do a skeleton reconstruction. So instead of uh, clicking and painting every single uh, pixel inside the, a new right, inside some membranes, they just want to click once and go very fast over the data set by iteratively constructing the skeleton of the neurons that you have in the block of tissue. And then you have to be careful, of course, so you say, OK, here there is a branch, here there is a synapse, but you go marking everything. Even you can select the direction of the synapses, et cetera. And then in this way, at the same time, you, you produce the connectivity matrix. You can export it afterwards uh, CVS, or you can even you know, reconstruct the skeletons in 3D and then get uh, fancy reconstructions over the, the whole data set. And then you see what uh, connects to what. OK, just to finish the, the, the theory part, just some take home messages for you. Um, I hope I convince you that uh, connectomics is at an early but uh, very promising stage. And I, I hope that now you're sure that it needs a multidisciplinary approach and a state-of-the-art uh, image processing method, but also hardware technology. Uh, the nice part of it is that it brings a lot of challenges from, for the biologists, but also for, for the engineers. It's pushing forward um, a lot of fields. And now there's also a lot of money uh, involved in it from the US administration, from the European uh, Union, et cetera. And I hope you see that these uh, techniques are very generic and flexible. As we mentioned before, they can be reused for other biological problems or image modalities. So you had to work with images at some point during your research. Please go ahead and install uh, Fiji, and you probably can find some nice solutions for you. OK, 
So now let's go into the, the demo part. I don't know if some of you installed the, the software as I um, mentioned on the, on the email. Otherwise, you can follow what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you how to do it on my own machine. The, yes, so you can download, for example, these two files, or one of them. And then it's going to be this image here. And then we can uh, play around with it at the same time. How much time do I have? Use the coffee time. Ten forty nine. I could go, it depends on them, but okay. uh, fifteen, twenty minutes. So I just want to show. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm going to go out of this. You don't see anything there. What if I do this? No. OK. This is the image. Is it just the base Fiji, or do we need some extra? It's space Fiji. Yeah. Did you get the image? The, the image? It's, uh, yeah, it's a, yeah. You have it? No? Let me see what I do have this. It's, you can get this link. Hasn't downloaded yet. Someone has it. Yes. Is it okay? Well, then I, I will start. Okay. So, yeah, we just go and let's see what is my go on plugins. Okay. Plugins. Once we have the image open, we can go to plugins segmentation. You see that there's a bunch of segmentation plugins here. There's a, a lot of registration. You need to do. Skeletonization, a lot of uh, tools that you, you may find useful. And in this case, we're going to go to trainable Weka segmentation. OK, let's click on it. It takes a few seconds to open. OK, it's open <laughs> in the wrong window. So, to segmentation, what was the, the method? Trainable Weka segmentation. And it should open this. OK? So this is, yeah, I'll put it there, back there. I hope, yeah. yeah. Any of those, it's just, uh, an, again, a TEM image, Drosophila um, larva brain. OK? It's very similar to the ones that I was using in the, in the presentation. These are from Albert Cardona, in fact. Is this good? Yep. OK. So this is the interface that I was telling you about before. You just uh, load one image, and then you see, uh, well, maybe from here. In this image, we have. Uh, Again, I'll, I'm telling you what you are seeing. So these are membranes. In this case, they're single uh, membranes. You have, this is, these are mitochondria, vesicles, some vessels here. This is a synapse. <laughs> you have to believe me on that. And the idea is that we need to tell the computer which pixels are which. Um, at the beginning, I just put two classes, so two types of pixels. You can actually rename them afterwards. So let's say, OK, I'm going to paint 
automatically gets this line selection. So you can say, okay, some of these pixels are going to be my class one, for example. Just click on up to class one. And then just make sure that you don't want to get the computer wrong, so you don't go through a membrane when you want the non-membrane class, for example. Okay, And then we need to provide at least two types of samples, of one class and the other one. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. So we just paint, again, for example, here very carefully on the membrane, and then add it to the to the other class, and it turns green. Okay. Linear line is alright. Yeah, I mean this. You can actually choose any of these guys here, and but for example, if I select a rectangle, it would take all of this. If I add it to, for example, this class. But those are uh, way too many samples for this small experiment. And if now I wanted to remove one of those. Yes, you want to remove? Just double click here. One click, select it, double click, we get rid of it, okay? Then, well, just with two samples, we can start to play a bit. We can then train the classifier. As you see, for, a sim for the simplicity of it, I didn't tell you what the classifier is or how many filters we're using. We just paint a little bit and train. Come again? Yes? You can select it as well. But then it's going to use all the pixels inside the area. So maybe it's too much. The good thing of this is that you have some sparse labeling. You can very fast just select some, some pixels. Okay? And then we, we click on Train Classifier. Okay, and hopefully, it takes some time. It tells you, OK, you selected 216 pixels as belonging to class 1, 108 to class two, and then you train a classifier. In this case, I use a random forest, which is one of the uh, famous machine learning methods. But it's cool because it provides uh, an estimation of the test error. It says, OK, you're probably going to have around 2.5% uh, of voxels mistaken. But this is based on the, on the samples that you made. So if you don't select representative pixels, then they will probably be mistaken. So we come back here, and you see it made a, a first estimation of the of your probabilities. I mean, of your, the probabilities of each class. Actually, what it shows here is applying a 50% probability to, uh, to each class, and then you say from one, the threshold is 50. No? So you say, OK, one side is red, one side is green. Are we there? Did it run? You can tell me if it uh, failed. It's probably my mistake. And then you can see the, the result. You say create result. Should create an image. Of course, it's on the wrong window. And then it gives you something like this. Just create result. You want to see the vinylization of it. The idea behind this, this kind of methods is that is what we call interactive learning. So now we have trained, but we are not satisfied with it because we see there are some errors. You can, for example, zoom in some areas. Let's say here. You can zoom either with the, with the plus key or uh, using the, the compass here, the magnifying glass. And you see how, for example, here you say, OK, this this membrane hasn't been um, added to the, to the membrane class. So I just put it myself, well, not using this, but again, this line. Just paint a little bit, add it to the green class, and then retrain. OK? Another train is to get faster because the features were already, the filters were already calculated, and then it gives you a new result. 
this case we have a lot of green. This is an interactive process where you can go back and forth between uh, your traces and, and the result until you are satisfied. Um, in particular, a good practice is to go to the settings. Okay. I uh, see. It will show you this big window. And then you see all the filters that you can use. Now we're using just five of them, but with uh, different uh, radius sizes, different uh, patch sizes. That means that uh, we're going to go, for example, you see here Gaussian blur. It's going to do a Gaussian of radius one but also the minimum is 1 to 16. So it's going to do 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, trying to get the information from many neighbors. Here you can actually choose the classifier. There's a list of it. You can. Weka is actually a famous Java library for machine learning, so you get many other methods over there. And the most important thing for me is to click here. In advanced options, you go homogenize classes. What it does it is to balance the number of samples that you have per, um, per class. Because, for example, here is very obvious. You get a lot of uh, non-membrane uh, pixels and just a few that are membranes. So you are tempted just to paint a little bit on the membranes and then scratch a lot of a non-membrane. But maybe you, you turn up with double the number of samples for, uh, for uh, soma, for cell bodies, than for membranes. So many methods can be affected by that. And they would tell you, OK, then just go and classify everything as a cell body. Because for example, imagine that you have one pixel is a membrane, you select it as membrane, and nine as cell bodies. Well, you just select everything. Uh, the, the classifier says everything is a cell body. The error is 10%. So it's not that bad for the, for the classifier. So you, the, the, the way to prevent this is to click here. So we're going to, before, um, before applying the, uh, training the classifier, we're going to resample the proportion of, of each sample. So this is if you have an even sampling? Yes. Okay. But it's always a, a good practice, because most methods get affected by this. And can we only have two classes, or is it possible to add? It's possible to add. Let's, say, well, let's first train this to see if there's any difference on the result. But in this case, not much, because the number of samples were already too close. But we can say, OK, let's create a new class. Again, this is on the wrong desktop. We'll show you this. You need just to put it in a name. Let's call it. Uh, Mitochondria, for example. Okay, and then it will get automatically added here. And now you can leave it uh, blank. Yeah. So again, just a, a quick overview question. So there are programs like um, IDL that have been around for forty years for mm -hmm. image processing. I mean, are you adding something new? Are you um, creating something that's much easier to use in the, in, for neuro, neuroscience images? You know, how does your software differ from these others? <laughs> Good question. So uh, on one side, I try to make something uh, attractive not only for uh, neuroscientists and not only for biologists, because this platform uses, uh, is used for, by tons of uh, especially biomedical image processing people, but also for the machine learning people. So by putting in contact Fiji and Weka, now I'm providing also new problems for the machine learners. So now they can test their algorithms against something that is actually useful for us. You can go here and say, OK, for the, the whole list of um, classifiers that I show you, some of them work really well. Some of them are crap. So these people now need to improve their methods in order to, to, to get, get good results. And it's also 
interesting for um, for people who never they, they don't have much knowledge about machine learning. They just have to come here and interactively have a solution that is better than a simple thresholding or a deterministic uh, method. Back to the mitochondria. No. I would actually add one, one point to your answer to that question. So one, I think there are two big differences to tools like MATLAB or IDL. The first one is this is free. Yes, sir. Yeah, IDL and MATLAB, they cost a fortune in particular if you're not at a university or a grant giving organization. The second is MATLAB and IDL, they are general purpose tools. So you have to, before you get to that level, you have to do a lot of work. So might as, you might as well ask the, the, the question, what's the difference between this and Java, or this and C++? Mm. The way I was thinking about it is IDL is basically a programming language. This is much closer to being an application with an ability to extend it. Um, and when you get to programming languages, you're just talking about the level at which you're programming. But this is much more like an application. So someone who basically knows nothing about programming could think of using this tool to do something useful. If you put someone who doesn't know how to program in IDL, in an IDL environment, you've got a month before they do anything. Mm. That's right. Uh, actually, well, you could presumably write this in IDL if you wanted to. My idea was to more to work as a bridge between the machine learning world and the biomedical imaging world, and also, in the meantime, produce some nice application for for users without experience. Just to okay. Just to finish with this demo, if I go, okay. let's say, okay, I selected, I, I added a new uh, class, for example, mitochondria. I say, okay, I want this to be a mitochondria. Just add it here. And then it, okay, it made a lot of mistakes, <laughs> but it adds a new class, and then you have now green, red, and, and blue, and then of course you need, to, you need to tell it, okay, these things are not mitochondria, you should correct from that, etc. It requires a, a few training back and forth until you get the desired result. Example this. But the good thing is that once you get to the, to the nice result that you expect, you can save it. And then you can apply this to all your images, even in a, in a cluster. And then you can leave it run it and say, OK, do the classification for me, or get me just the probabilities. Or, and then I would work from that and create another pipeline. OK, so just to finish before coffee, let me show you the game that I was mentioning before. OK, Ugh. doesn't fit here. OK, more or less. So I told you in, in our pipeline, we need to um, uh, actually make sure, proofread the results that we get. And for that, we brought our, our um, tool, our software tool, to the, to the crowd, to the website. We created a website called iWire. And then once you log in, you can just play with different pieces of a block of uh, retina tissue. As I mentioned before, see here, you don't see organelles. This is un unfortunate, but th this was one of the first um, uh, data sets that they produce. Uh, in fact, this is from uh, Heidelberg, from Winfrey Tank. And then the idea is that, OK, you don't see it. I you go into the website in your computer, you probably see it better. So you can go through the sections. And then in dark blue, you see the portion that the, our machine learning, our artificial intelligence method, has decided it goes together. So at some point, it's lost. And you say, OK, I think this should go together. So you just have to click. In fact, 
instead of solving splits and mergers, what we do, oh, there's a chat as well. So whenever you do something, someone else is also talking to you. So you just have to click because it's easier to solve uh, uh, mergers, uh, I mean splits than mergers. Because imagine that in 3D, if you want to cut a volume into two, you have to select where and how. And it's much more complicated than just knowing that you have a lot of pieces that you have to put back together. And then once you click, then you see it gets reconstructed in 3D. And then you see if it makes sense or not. And then you can go on, follow the, the whole process. And see, like there's some pieces that are missing. Just click again, click again. It goes automatically reconstructed. You see, OK, does it look crazy? You can go farther, farther, farther. OK, maybe this should go together too. And then it goes the, out of the out of the screen. At this point, I just say, OK, well, I'm finished. Are you sure you're done with this cube? Yes, I'm sure. And then it gives you your, some points based on how um, similar the people who segmented this or corrected this segmentation corrected uh, the round segmentations uh, in, in base of, uh, of not the clicks, but the volumes uh, comparisons. And the idea is that we tested many people with the same volumes, and then we get to, um, to an agreement between the crowds. And this is what we're going to use as the, the, the real thing, the solution. And then every day has a, a different ranking. There's some people that have no much other things to do, and they spend hours here. <laughs> or there's some people that just want to help. And you see that you don't need much knowledge. You just have to have an idea what the a neuron suit looks like. But it's also some training. You can select some tours, and then it tells you, OK, this is a, a, this type of a neuron, so it should look like this. Don't go and merge things that uh, shouldn't, et cetera. And then once you get done, it shows you, goes, well, you've seen just the, the big cell that we're reconstructing now. And then it goes through another part of it. And then inside this, there are games. There are, for example, uh, I think it was last summer, we made a competition between the people who started playing uh, through Facebook with the people who started from Twitter and from Reddit, et cetera. There were different teams. And then the, the winners had some, some prizes, or uh, my boss made a funny video for them, et cetera. It's way, ways of attracting regular people into science, which is always nice, but also helping us uh, solve our problems. And I think with this, I'm done. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>